The government has as much of a right to control what I as an adult put into my body as it does what I put into my mind. It's none of their business. <laughs> I was appointed to the bench by Governor Duke Nation at the end of 1983. Uh, I was still a drug warrior. You know, I'd been a member of Navy JAG, uh, actually writing charge sheets against my fellow shipmates from the Naval Air Station in Guam, uh, who had been in a run afoul of various laws, certainly including drug laws. I was a criminal defense attorney representing other people from different uh, stations who were charged with drug offenses, among others. Uh, and then I was a federal prosecutor for several years in Los Angeles. In fact, I held the, the record for the largest drug prosecution in the Central District of California back in 1978, uh, 75 kilos of heroin, 160 pounds, which was and is a whole lot of heroin. Uh, does anyone have a concept of what the drug prosecution record is today in the Central District of California? Uh, 18 tons of cocaine in one place, actually, in Silmar. So you begin to look at your own experience. You look at what's going on in your own courtroom. You're churning low-level drug offenders through the system for no good purpose whatsoever. Uh, you are arresting some even high-level dealers. Uh, and if you do that, does that mean that heroin is no longer available on the streets of Santa Ana or wherever? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that somebody else sees that as an employment opportunity. And I came to the realization at that time, and that realization has to be understood by others. The tougher we get with regard to drug crime, literally the softer we get with regard to the prosecution of everything else. And in 1990, we were only half as successful in prosecuting homicides countrywide as we had been in 1980. Why? Well, because the Reagan administration once again had ratcheted up the, the war on drugs, so we were using all of these prosecutorial resources to prosecute nonviolent drug offenders such that robbers, rapers, and murderers were being able to skate with regard to their charges because we didn't devote those resources for that offense. Who is winning today with regard to this failed policy? And I have six groups. Travel along with me and see if you agree. The first group, obviously, are the drug lords. Big time drug dealers, they're making hundreds of millions, billions of dollars every year, tax free, by the way, and they're clearly winning. The number two group of people that are winning are those in juvenile gangs. Pretty much every juvenile gang we have in our country gets its primary source of funding for the sale of illegal drugs, and now they're using it as a recruiting tool to bring more children into this lifestyle because they too can be part of the action and make some money. Number three group of people that are winning are basically those in law enforcement that are making big time government money to fight against the first two groups. And I'm not pointing the finger at law enforcement. They haven't failed us any more for the war on drugs than Elliot Ness failed us with regard to the war on alcohol. Uh, but it's the system. But nevertheless, their bureaucracies have expanded. Their amounts of money, their power have all expanded as well. They're winning. Fourth group of people are the politicians that basically talk tough with regard to the war on drugs. Not smart, but they get elected and re-elected by talking tough. Of course, it's our fault because we continue to elect them, but they come out ahead. Number five groups are those in the private sector that make money because of increased crime. Who might that be? Obviously, the people that build prisons, enormously lucrative occupation. People that staff prisons. In the state of California, the Prison Guards Union is the strongest political lobby group we have. They're winning, and of course, they're laughing at us. And the sixth group of people that are winning are the terrorist organizations of the world. You look at any terrorist organization from Osama bin Laden or anywhere else, the primary source of funding is drug money. It's the sale of illegal drugs to the degree that I say that drug prohibition is the golden goose of terrorism. And if our government really wanted to do something damaging to terrorist groups around the world, they would take the one step that would do that, repeal drug prohibition. Who is losing? everybody else. I've been speaking actively against our nation's drug policy since 1992. The first national TV show I was on, they basically stacked it with a lot of uh, parents of drug, drug uh, problems for their kids. And the first question I got was, why are you trying to kill my son? And it kind of got worse from there. That doesn't happen anymore. People are beginning to understand. There is an initiative now in California to treat marijuana like alcohol for adults. What would happen if this were to pass? Well, six things. The first five demonstrably beneficial, then we'll talk about the sixth. 
The first thing that would happen is we in the state of California as taxpayers literally could save hundreds of millions of dollars per year, if not a billion dollars a year, that now we actually spend in a futile effort to try to eradicate marijuana as well as to incarcerate, prosecute and incarcerate nonviolent marijuana offenders. And of course you can tell how successful we are in, in uh, the eradication of marijuana because it's still the largest cash crop in the state of California. And number two is grapes, by the way, if you care. So that's a billion dollars or so that we can save. Number two, we could tax the silly stuff and generate revenue according to the head, the chair of the State Board of Equalization of about $1.3 billion every year. So now that's about a $2.3 billion shift in the budget deficit for the state of California you'd think somebody would notice. But the third thing trumps the first two and that is we would make marijuana less available for children than it is today. That is something that really does deserve a great deal of attention. Number four, the entire hemp industry could be revitalized. Goes back thousands of years to the degree that in ancient Greek the word canvas and cannabis were synonymous. They were the same word uh, and we have simply thwarted that entire really important uh, industrial purpose. We do have our merchants using hemp today, and by the way, hemp, you know, is just the stalk of the marijuana plant. It has no mind-altering properties whatsoever, but it can be used for all kinds of really beneficial purposes. So now our merchants import the raw material from those radical countries like Canada and England, for heaven's sake, penalizing ourselves and our own agricultural purposes. Uh, you'd think that we could somehow realize what's going on because uh, the Canadian hemp uh, field is worth, you know, about a billion dollars a year. And the fifth thing, this entire medical marijuana issue would pretty much dissolve, and hooray for that. It would get some control on it, regulate it, control it, tax it, and bring it back under the law. Then there's the sixth thing. What's that going to do to marijuana usage by adults? And any economist, of course, will tell you that's really pretty simple. It will increase marijuana use by adults. Uh, all things being equal. But all things are not going to be equal. We'll probably soon start experiencing the what I call the Holland effect. Because in Holland, anybody 16 years of age or older can go to a coffee house and can get coffee and sandwiches and tea and also marijuana and hashish. The Minister of Health of Holland held a press conference not all that long ago and said, we in our country have only half the marijuana consumption per capita as you do in the United States of America, both for adults and for teenagers. Wait a minute, you hear that? Both for adults and for teenagers. Then went on to explain why. You know what he said? He said, we have succeeded in making pot boring. People that are supporting the status quo are on the wrong side of history just like the people that, that uh, the, the Billy Sundays and, and uh, the Anslingers and the rest who supported alcohol prohibition were on the wrong side of history. It's just a question of when. And then I guarantee anyone who will listen that two years after we change away from this failed and hopeless policy, everybody will join arms, look back astonished, aghast that we could have perpetuated such a failed system for so long. The best thing I can do for my country is to help us repeal drug prohibition. It's the most patriotic thing that I'm able to do, and we're going to be successful. It's outrageous when you call me over.